So just running you very briefly through some issues uh, in terms of, uh, of stack development. Uh, what we, heard, what we heard so far is we have the membranes, we have the catalytic layers, we have the gas, uh, the gas diffusion layers, and we have the bipolar plates. Now we have to somehow arrange them into a fuel cell stack, which electrically series connects the individual cells and connects the cells media-wise. And so uh, what you typically do is you start with a specification, you do some rough design, you do some flow model, and then you build the thing and validate it, and then you typically get some better ideas, and you run the the overall design. Uh, you run the overall design issue all over again. And just to give you an, an impression, there is there are many ways of designing, let's say, flow channels. Uh, and you have to you have to pick the right one for your application. For example, a serpentine flow channel. Uh, needs uh, some special requirement, uh, needs some special designs around the, bend, uh, the bends, particularly in order to avoid gas flow through the gas diffusion layer, which eventually affects your stack performance, particularly what the optimum gas utilization, uh, or what's uh, related to the optimum gas utilization. Interdigitated uh, flow fields, they're pretty good in homogenizing flow through the porous media, however, you need a lot of pressure a pressure difference between inlet and outlet, which system-wise sometimes kills you uh, in terms of, of energy efficiency. Then what you ha also have to, uh, to take into account, there is no, in technical stacks, there is no such thing as a sharp edge. So you always have to, you always have to let's say, uh, live with all the wall angles and the radii at the bottom and then the top uh, of of the current collecting zone, and particularly these radii, they can cost you uh, current collection if you're collecting efficiency. If you have to, if you need to have two wide radii, radii here, you, you're losing area there. Then uh, another very uh, very important point is your gas diffusion layers will sink into your uh, distribution channels. So you have to make sure that there is sufficient room for that, and that the precision of manufacturing of the gas uh, of the gas distribution layer and the precision of the gas diffusion layer are sufficiently harmonized in, not in order not to, let's say, mess up too much uh, of the free space and uh, not to, uh, not to, let's say, um, create too inhomogeneous flow. And always be aware there will be liquid water in those channels. And you have to make sure that this liquid water doesn't clog any, uh, any channel or any, uh, any row of channels. This is just the current voltage curve of the whole stack. That's the current voltage curve of the best performing cell. And that's the current voltage curve of the worst performing cell. And in here, under these flow conditions, we find water formation, water droplet formation. Uh, and looking, <coughs> looking at that, we can do quite a bit when understanding how the droplet moves on a given surface, how much force you need to push a droplet out. And there, we, there is sort of a rule of thumb which we developed for fuel cells that we need some 10 to 40 millibars per meter of ch channel length in terms of pressure drop in order to be sure that all the water gets out. Now, we had a heated debate of the use of uh, flow modeling uh, in uh, PEM fuel cells and how good they are to predict performance. Well, flow modeling doesn't predict performance. It just predicts that you have sort of a, sort of a homogeneous distribution of flow and that you can, let's say, see the velocities and the temperature at, diff at different areas and you can see the flow vectors. And if you detect the flow vector going th across a rib, uh, across, uh, across uh, a wall area, then you're losing capability of running the, uh, of running the fuel cell at low stoics. That's, very, that's a very important result of flow modeling. It also, you can also model, in a sense, the gas distribution or the, the gas concentration distribution inside the channel and see 
if your channel becomes too shallow or too deep in order to, opt, uh, to, to, optimum, uh, to do an optimum uh, supply of media to the, uh, to the gas distribution zone. <coughs> Um, let's say correlating modeling results with, uh, in a sense, with uh, experimental results, you will find that there is a strong influence of the rip to channel ratio on the cell resistance and on the cell performance. And you will improve, see improved mass transport uh, uh, if you are <coughs> lowering the rip to channel ratio. And so doing that CFD modeling will help you a lot. It will also help you a lot in terms of temperature distribution and to identify dangerous uh, parts where uh, eventually uh, uh, pinholes can form. So uh, we skipped the ceiling area and basically do some, well the pretty much the same applies for, uh, for the manifolding channels, right? So if you, you have to do the right dimensioning of the manifolding channels in order to uh, let's say uh, equally supply uh, each cell with the right uh, with the right amount of media, and if we look at no, uh, if we look at that graph, here we see here we see flow through a, uh, a through an, uh, through a parallel network uh, of cells uh, when the manifolding channel was too narrow, so the pressure drop along the manifolding channel was too high as compared to the pressure drop across the cell. And as soon as you fix that, you've got a homogeneous, uh, you get homogeneous distribution. And you get much more uniform, uh, uniform operation and you get much, more, uh, much more, uh, more lifetime out of it. This is the issue of, uh, of end plate buckling. So you, your design has to compensate for that, basically. Uh, so if you do it right, well you can achieve quite nice performance and just one design cycle uh, that I want to show you this is uh, we started out with let's say a generic system design having a stack in an environment with a blower and a humidifier and in a sense a uh, and in a sense a hydrogen recirculation loop this was part of the work of a European project called outer stack and then we thought well this stack needs a certain power but it also must fit under the hood of a vehicle. So this gave some constraint on the overall volume you could, in a sense, access with the stack. And this volume gave some constraints to the design and it also gave some very strict constraints to the dimensioning of the parts and the power density you had to, uh, you had to require from the stack. And this gave, in a sense, uh, the, ba the background to uh, the stack specifications in terms of specific power, in terms of operating characteristics, uh, that means uh, heat release, and in terms of, of dimensioning. And so one can come to a, let's say, a very first and rough uh, primary design and then go through all kinds of flow modeling in order to see uh, how, to, how to get very narrow transition zones, how to get sufficiently dimensioned manifolding zones, how to get sufficient pressure drop across the, uh, ac uh, across the bipolar plate in order to push, all the, uh, to push all the water out. And so you can study the velocity distribution in the anode side and the humidity di distribution in the anode and the cathode side and basically optimize your design towards that. Uh, look for the oxygen concentration and then start to make your drawings and your compression unit. Finally, basically your stack and validate the whole thing and at the end of the day you come pretty close to where you specified uh, your stack when using the, uh, when using the proper uh, when using the proper materials. So just keep in mind this is uh, uh, stack design is not uh, does not end with a proper cell. There needs is a lot more to it, and then if you expand your vision across the, uh, uh, wider than the stack, you also have to take into account how much energy is going into the into the overall system, like fuel processing, like all that, all kinds of stuff. And let's say the most uh, critical. Uh, 
candidate there is the air compressor. The air compressor will cost you most of the auxiliary energy that you put into a fuel cell system. And if you, do it, if you don't do that right, the matching between the air compressor, the pressure drop across the, uh, across the stack, um, <coughs> and so on, then you typically have an energy sink rather than an electricity, so uh, electricity uh, source. Uh, and again, uh, let's say, no, I, we don't go through that. Uh, these guys here, they're consuming a lot of energy. They're creating a lot of heat. And they're the ones you have to. They're the ones you have to vary first when integrating systems. So that was <laughs> this, uh, this was two hours presentation in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank the.